Yeah. Um, well, just say a little bit about yourself, first of all. Um, my name is Paul Mallard, and um, I, I've kind of just retired from pastoral ministry. Um, I've been a pastor for 40 years, and I've been a preacher for 50 years. Um, uh, and I'm now come from Birmingham originally, and I'm now back to Birmingham. Um, one of the things you never do, incidentally, you never do this. It's, it's, it's a crime which is very difficult to forgive, and that is to confuse Birmingham and the black country. The black country is totally separate from Birmingham. But I kind of straddle it in that I, I, I grew up my earliest years in, in Smethwick and in Bearwood, which is two, three, four miles away from here. So, so I had roots in the black country, and then I grew up in Birmingham. And, and we retired been back in Birmingham for about six months, and uh, I live in a place, would you believe, a place called Hollywood. Yeah. It sounds great, doesn't it? You know, my wife and I come from Hollywood, but it's actually a suburb of South Birmingham. And um, it's been great to, to, to talk with David and to find out about the denomination and about uh, the day. And um, I noticed that when at the beginning it was announced that we we're going to talk about suffering, there are a number of groans from the, from the, uh, the group here. But I hope that by the end of the day we'll see why this is a particularly relevant subject for us to discuss. When I started in ministry, as I say, over 40 years ago now, um, I used to travel to a minister's meeting with an old boy who'd been a minister for, I don't know, 200 years, I think it was. Yeah, his name was, he was an old strict Baptist minister. His name was Mr. Ebenezer Knight. This was down in Wiltshire. So, I'm Mr. Knight, hello. And he introduced his wife as Mrs. Florence Knight. Yeah. So, together they were known as Eb and Flo. So, <laughs> and he was a great influence on me and a great help to me in my, in my early days in ministry. And I asked him one day, now, Eb, I'm a pastor now, what do I need to know, first and foremost, about the common day, about the flock, about the people I minister to? And he thought for a minute, and what he said to me absolutely shocked me. Because he said, what you need to remember is that the people in your congregation, Christians in general, tell lies. And that's not what I expected. <laughs> Okay, Ed, you better, yeah, what do you mean? He said, well, I'll tell you when it is. It's at about 12 o'clock on a Sunday lunchtime, and you've just finished the service, and you're standing at the door, and you're shaking their hands, and you're saying to them, how's it going? How are you doing? And they say, I'm doing fine. And you know that their lives are falling apart. They've struggled through, through the week. They've arrived at church, and it's been dreadful. And you say to them, how are you doing? And they say, I'm doing that. And he said, they, they tell lies. They don't mean to. And the reason is, the motive is not a bad motive, but they think, well, I can't take my problems to church, and, and I'm going to put on a mask, and I'm going to pretend everything is well, when it's not. I have to kind of give that impression, because Christians don't suffer. If they do, they let the side down. And we've got to pretend that... So, so that, that was a shock to my system, but I can say to you now, 40 years later, the people you minister to, the people you preach to, the people you serve in your churches, the people you minister to have either suffered in the past, or they're suffering now, or they will suffer in the future. And that will affect the way in which you think about them, it will affect the way in which you preach to them, the way in which you pray for them. And so hopefully, that will be um, what we will talk about today. We'll help in some little way to understand the problem of suffering and to find something of the help that the Bible gives. Now, this isn't a lecture, it's a seminar. You know what the difference between a lecture and a seminar is? Anybody like to hazard a guess? It's a two and a fro thing. A a fro thing okay? So I'm going to talk, but at certain points, I'm going to ask you to talk to the people around you on particular questions, and then have some feedback, and then I'll talk again. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. If you're one of those people who don't like doing that, just, just close your eyes and pretend to pray. <laughs> and and, and we we'll think, we'll think that's what you're doing. You should have a copy of the notes. Um, uh, these were sent out, and so you've got a copy of them. If you haven't, I think you've got a few spare ones. Does anybody need a spare set of notes? 
This is Suffering Christian Perspectives Seminar 1. Okay, so if we can have the next slide, please. So if we just go through them uh, in, in, in order. Um, I, I don't know how long ago it was, but I guess I've been in ministry for about uh, three or four years when we had a, a tragedy in the church. It was a lady who had uh, their first child. Her husband and wife, they had their first child. And, and you know, you celebrate when the baby's brought. We, we, we were a Baptist church, so we didn't baptize the baby, but we, we brought, dedicated the baby to the Lord. And we had a wonderful time. And everybody was joyful and it was marvelous. And then, a few months later, they discovered that the baby had died on one of those tragic cop deaths. I remember the, the funeral and uh, had this tiny little coffin and it's placed there in a, in, a, in, a, in a cemetery up in Wiltshire on the, on the side of the hill. And as you can imagine, everybody was devastated. Four or five months, four or five months later, there was a phone call from the husband. And I remember it was a bitterly, bitterly cold night. Remember when you go out to your car and you have to kind of breathe into the lock to try and unlock it? It's all electronic these days, but you have to breathe into the lock. And, and the husband said, well, please come and see my wife. I don't know what to say to her. She's just beside herself. She just can't cope. And so I got in the car and praying like mad, I drove to the house. <coughs> the husband brought me in and he took me into the room where the wife was. And she said, Pastor, you're going to want to throw me out of your church, aren't you? And I said, why? She said, just the thoughts I'm having, they're just so terrible. You know, I know my little boy is with Jesus. I know he's safe. But I can't help thinking of him. And every day I think of him. And tonight, on this bitterly, bitterly cold night, I think of my little boy up in the ground on that cold hillside. And what I want to do is to go up there and get a blanket and lay it over the ground to keep him warm. I know I can't do it, I know it's stupid. And you're going to want to throw me out of the church, aren't you? And I said, no, I want to hug you, I don't want to tell you about heaven, but I don't know whether I did much good. I hope I did. But I came away thinking that lady has tasted the depths of sorrow and actually, actually, it's left a scar on her life that will never go away. So yes, Lewis, speaking about the subject of suffering, says, imagine that you, you have a, an appendix out. You've got a scar there, and you can see the scar, but it's just a scar. It can affect you in any particular way. Um, but imagine instead of having a, a, an appendix out, imagine that you've lost a leg. What's the matter there? Well, it's with you for the rest of your life. You know, some days you feel that phantom pain where the leg used to be. Other days you'll wake up, and you'll forget, and you'll, you'll get out of bed, and you'll stumble and fall on your face. It will always be there. And then C.S. Lewis says, you know, some suffering, it comes and it goes, and we remember it, it's no big deal. Other suffering stays with us, and it leaves scars on us for the rest of our lives. And actually, we never receive healing for those scars until we get to heaven. So we have to be realistic about the subject, and we have to be sensitive, and we have to be gentle about the subject. Why, why, why am I speaking about it? Well, partly because I've been a pastor, partly because... Um, it's a subject I've thought a great deal about, partly because um, for 31 years now, 31 years, my wife has struggled with multiple sclerosis. She's actually been a wheelchair for 31 years. Um, um, she, she discovered that she had these problems while she was pregnant with our last child. We've got four kids, our daughter Emmaus. Uh, Edric is pregnant, she's taken to the hospital, they did this, that, never. They discovered that it was MS. And um, she went into the wheelchair 31 years ago. We know that because our daughter celebrated her 31st birthday in July. So, so that's the length of it. And um, this sounds like an exaggeration, but it's not. Uh, for the last 10 years at least, there hasn't been a single night when she hasn't woken up with intense pain. So. Two o'clock this morning, I was rubbing her back with Ralgex just to try and deal with some of the pain that she felt in her back. And um, um, is it Ralgex or is it? It was one of those. Sorry, I don't know what it was. I, I sprayed it and it went up my nose and it tasted horrible. But you know, you're not supposed to ingest it, are you? But, you know, 
so, 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 you know, in a way, you know, what I guess I'm, I guess I'm speaking about is, is theology, but in just ideas, but ideas that I've had to hammer out in my own heart and in my own life as we've kind of gone through. Next slide, please. I'm, I'm putting two slides on, on um, <laughs> but we won't use that one. Let's get the next slide, please. Okay. Uh, if you look at your notes, uh, I'm going to start working through the notes now. There are two verses very close together in Romans chapter 8 that are about things that we know. If we just go to the next slide for a minute. Next one. Here's the, here's, the, here's the one that we all quote. We know, we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his. But we all know that and we quote it often. And we, we can kind of sometimes use this as a bit of a sledgehammer. Don't worry, everything's going to be fine. God is working out all things for your good. And that, that's true and it's wonderfully true. And Paul says we know that. In just, a, in just an idea in our minds, we know that in the end God loves us and he's working out even the most painful circumstances for our good, okay? We may not see it, see it, we may not feel it, but we know it nonetheless. And notice all things, not most things, not legally everything, all things for the Christian. God is working for good. Even when we fail, we may need to repent and we may be disciplined or chastened by God, but even that God can use and does use for our good. Go back to the previous slide if you can, please, the one that was just before. But just before saying this, Paul also says this, we know, and it's clear that he wants us to put the two side by side. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. The whole creation, everything, has been groaning in the pains of childbirth. Now some of you today can tell me about the pains of childbirth, can't you? And I'm looking at the ladies rather than the men. <laughs> You know, I don't know whether it's more painful for when a woman's giving birth or the man's standing by watching. What, what would you say about that? <laughs> the woman. <laughs> the woman, thank you. Okay. It's painful, it's intensely painful. <coughs> but it's a productive pain, it's a positive pain, because at the end, there's a baby. And Paul says, the whole of creation is suffering, the whole of it. And then he goes on, look at this. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit. Now, who have the first fruits of the Spirit? Us, meaning Christians. So, so he's talking here about Christians. We've got the Holy Spirit. We, we have the first one. We have all these wonderful blessings. But we also groan inwardly as we eagerly wait our adoption to such a, the redemption of our bodies. You see what Paul's saying there? We, we, even as Christians, we've got so many blessings. We're adopted into God's family. But we haven't got everything yet. We still live in bodies that are getting older. We're waiting for the redemption of our bodies. In other words, we're waiting for the resurrection when we get brand new bodies with no pain, no suffering, no, no tears, no nothing like that. But at the moment, our situation is one of suffering. Next slide, please. And the one after that. Oh, okay, two things that we're going to look at in this first uh, first Sunday. First of all, we're going to just just recognise that trials are universal. Everybody suffers. And then secondly, we're going to look at two misconceptions by looking very briefly at the book of Job. Next slide, please. Trials are universal. And the next one. Thank you. We are broken people living in a broken world. Everybody you minister to, everybody you preach to. Can, can I just check? Is everybody here a preacher? Virtually? Most of you? A lot. A lot of you. Okay. So, 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 even if you don't preach, you minister in other situations, you pray with people, you talk to people um, in the world and so on. So we're all broken people in a broken world. Next slide, please. Why is the subject important? Why is it important that we've got a day today where we're talking about, well, arguably, it is the greatest challenge to the Christian faith. What do I mean by that? Well, in a world that, that, that has rejected God, we're trying to do evangelism, we're trying to tell people about Jesus, in my experience, anyway, every time I do an evangelistic course, Christianity Explored, or Alpha, or whatever it is, whenever there's an opportunity for questions, almost always the one question that you can guarantee will come up, how can you believe in God when there's so much suffering in the world? And so we need to have some answers to that. Number two, it's a real problem for the people you minister to. We've said that already. When you look at your congregation, they may be wearing masks, but people have suffered or are suffering or will suffer, and you need to minister into that situation. 
Suffering is folded into the fabric of our lives. Okay, in other words, we can't escape it. Next slide, please. The only condition to suffer is to live long enough. Think about that for a moment. If you live long enough, you will suffer. If you die at the age of 18, full of health and, 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 and prosperous and happy and in a good relationship, then you haven't suffered. But then who wants to die at 18? If you live longer, you will suffer. And sometimes it seems unjust and disproportionate. Now, just to, to give my wife's example, when she wakes in the middle of the night in intense pain, she'll say to me sometimes, I don't understand why God's allowing this. I don't understand what I've done wrong. Or she'll sometimes say, if the Lord's teaching me lessons, surely I've learned enough lessons by right now. It just seems, you know, it seems excessive, doesn't it? God wants us to grow through suffering. Why is it important to talk about it? Because actually suffering, and we'll see this particularly in the third seminar, has a purpose in God's plan for our lives. Uh, we're to care for each other when we suffer, and, and, and suffering opens opportunities for the gospel. Very often people will live their lives as if not thinking about God when their life falls apart and their life falls out. They want to know well, what's going on. And they're ready for answering questions. Okay, next slide, please. We suffer because we're human. We've seen that in Romans chapter 8. The whole creation suffers. And we're part of the creation. You know, people who are not Christians get cancer and have heart disease and Alzheimer's. And Christians get cancer and heart disease and Alzheimer's. They're exactly the same. Well, we're all human. But we also suffer because we're Christians. You know, a lot of what the Bible says about suffering is suffering because we're following Jesus. So Paul goes to the churches that he's planted in Asia Minor, you know, and he goes back to them and he says, look, you have to pass through many trials to enter the kingdom of God. Increasingly, I think it's difficult to follow Jesus faithfully. What we believe is countercultural. If we believe what the Bible says about gender, marriage, and so on, we are completely against the culture. And increasingly it's going to be difficult. And we suffer if we're servants of God. Paul says, you know, in my life I'm suffering because I'm serving you. Next slide, please. Um, if, you, if you take your Bible for a minute, you don't need to, but if, if you do, and you take out the last two chapters of the Bible, Revelation 21 and 22, and you take out the first two chapters of the Bible, Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, and it looks a little bit like that. Okay, in Genesis 1 and 2, there's no suffering. There's no pain, there's no sickness, there's no death. And in Revelation 21 and 22, it says, in this new creation, a new heavens and the earth, there's no pain, or sickness, or suffering, or death. Isn't that great? <laughs> Trouble is, but we live in the middle of the book. That's where we live. We're not in Eden anymore, and we're not yet in the new creation. We're there. And so we should be aware of the fact that suffering is certain in our lives. We can't escape it. Job talks about that his life has been as sufferings like the sparks that fly upwards. And uh, 2 Corinthians 4 7 talks about our feeble bodies, like lots of clay. Um, Christians are not immune. Next slide, please. Um, it's, it's like, it's a beautiful world out there. We all, we all agree that the world is beautiful, don't we? But we kind of look at the world fractures if we're looking through a broken plane of glass. So you look at the world, and there's the world beautiful, but, but suffering changes everything. Next slide, please. Uh, and here are some things that have been said to me over the years. They're all anonymous, but these kind of things, and you may have heard them, life is not meant to be like this. You, you might hear these phrases, you can think of them, phrases that you mean in your own head, you've just preached, and someone just speaks to you on the door and tells you the truth. After being patient for so long, why is my marriage so miserable? If you're a Christian, you know you have a perfect marriage, don't you? <laughs> okay, how do you do it? It's the union of two sinners. Um, I can't go to church on Mother's Day since we learn we can't have children. I've heard that from two or three ladies. Next slide, please. Chronic pain has invaded every part of my life. I can't enjoy anything. Pain kind of covers everything, or covers everything. He was everything to me. I thought we would grow all together. Now he's gone. I don't want to go on again. I heard just the other day a lady, a man on the radio, and his wife had died, and he said, in the morning when you wake up, 
in a double bed and, and you're not in the first thing in the morning when you're kind of half awake and half asleep and he said, you know, you can just come into consciousness and I reach across to my wife, as I always do, and I realise the bed is cold and empty because she's gone. And, and if you've not experienced that kind of grief, well, you don't probably know what it means, but people do. Here's the next one. Next slide, please. I thought the church was supposed to be a place to be included. How can it be so toxic? <laughs> well, suffering happens in church because of the way in which churches treat people. You, you, heard, you heard heavy shepherding? You know what I mean by heavy shepherding? I used to say in our church we didn't have heavy shepherding, we just had heavy sheep. <laughs> <laughs> okay? Why does the darkness never stop? Next slide, please. That's my little grandson. His name is Abraham. Gorgeous? A little Welsh boy. Uh, when he was born, he was discovered to have a very rare uh, neurological condition. It's a Latin name, but the, 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 the English is smooth brain. You know the brain's like a, a walnut? Well, his brain has none of those folds because from about 16 weeks or so, his brain never developed. So little Abe is just about this month to celebrate his sixth birthday, but he has a life expectancy of no more than 10 years. And he has no higher faculties, so he can't speak, he's blind, he can't understand anything, he can't talk or walk or, or, or anything. He has no, he's like a newborn baby. And um, he has severe epileptic fits that are so bad that he breaks his own bones just by the way in which he tends it. And um, of all the things that my wife and I have had to go through, this has been the most painful of all. We hold this little boy in our hands, and there's no explanation, there's no medical explanation, but, but we can't find any simple theological explanation as well. And yet we see the way in which his mum and dad love him, how precious he is. I mean, as far as the world is concerned, they'd say, well, he's got no right to live as he's not of any value at all. He's a valueless person. How dare they say that? Mm -hmm. Little Abraham is a very precious person to us. But he poses the question to us every time we see him, why, Lord? Why? Why? Next slide, please. This is a quotation from Tim Keller. No matter how, what precautions we take, no matter how well we have put together a good life, no matter how hard we have worked to healthy, wealthy, comfortable with friends and family, successful with our careers, something will inevitably go wrong. Next slide, please. So in what ways do we experience suffering in this fallen world? Why is suffering dangerous for the Christian? You have two minutes to discuss that and three minutes to report back. Okay? Can you do that? Go for it.
Mental trauma, okay? We haven't really mentioned mental illness, but mental illness is one of the hardest things, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, when we meet people and you know, snap out of it. Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. it's not like that. Okay, other things? Bereavement. Bereavement, it's huge. Yeah, anything else? Taxes. Taxes, okay. <laughs> do, you mean, do, you mean, do you mean you phone and you, you, you phone up and they don't come? Or do you mean you have to pay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm going thirsty. Sorry? Hunger and thirst. Hunger and thirst, okay. Then we're going to get to the second question. Why is it dangerous for us as Christians? Make you bitter until you make you turn you away from God. Become bitter. I, I often pray for people, Lord, help this not to make them bitter, but to make them better. Mm -hmm. Lord, please use this suffering to drive them to you rather than driving them from you. Because both things can happen, can't they? Yeah. It challenges us with a sense of guilt that we shouldn't be feeling like we are. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. What's wrong with me? And you feel guilty. I should do better. I should do better than this. Anything else? I, one, one thing I've heard uh, twice recently. One is a mother whose daughter has got type 1 diabetes. And on a Facebook page when she, when she announced to her friends this is the diagnosis, one of her friends said, um, God doesn't want me to have this. Uh, and then a, a friend this week who's got has had addiction problems, been in prison, uh, got mental health issues, and he's been to a psychologist one day and he's going to a healing service the next day. And he said the same phrase, God doesn't want me to have this. Yeah. And, I, I, yeah, it's starting from the wrong position, but it, it's sort of almost picking verses and then saying, and giving them a, a really unrealistic hope. Yeah. And it's making suffering worse, because not only am I suffering, I'm suffering because I've done something bad, or because I don't have enough faith. Which leads us very nicely to the next thing. Okay, so let's, let's move on. Let's run through these next two. I don't want the next one, or the next one, or the next one. Two misconceptions, and the next one. We're going to start with Joe for a bit. Please, the next one, please. Two misconceptions. Next one, please. First misconception. Next slide. Okay. Believers should not suffer, which is your, your point exactly. Christians shouldn't suffer. So, so think about Job for a moment. You, you know the story of Job. Uh, Job loses his possessions and his family. So, so all that he owns is a wealthy man. Everything he owns goes, loses the lot, and he loses his family. You know, his, all his children. Okay. And then in the next chapter, he loses his health, both physical and his well-being. It's not just physical health he loses, it's kind of mental health as well. And we're all vulnerable in those areas. If you think about it for a moment, in our, our finances, and our job, and our, our physical possessions, and our family, our loved ones, and our physical, those three areas, all of us are vulnerable. But all of us can suffer in that way. Not as much as Job might be, but all of us. And the question is, was Job a particularly bad sinner? Is that the reason why he would suffer? Next slide, please. Um, and, and that's a view which is common, and the, the one you mentioned earlier. 
Suffering is always your fault. If you're suffering, and I know this, my wife has said this loads of times, if you're suffering, it's not because God wants you to suffer, there's something wrong with you. It's as if there's God, and there's you, and there's a pipe of healing that comes from God, and the pipe has been blocked. It's not blocked at God's end, it's blocked at yours end. You are consciously or unconsciously disobeying God. That's the reason you're suffering, you're, you're sinning. You may not know it, but you are. You're hiding a secret sin. Okay, I can't see it, and he can't see it, but you know, and God knows that's why he's making you suffer. You've given in to the seductions of the devil. Okay, next slide, please. You lack faith. It may not be because of sin, but because you don't have enough faith. If you had more faith, you'd be healed. God wants you well, all the fault lies on your side. Now, now, now for example, um, someone came to see me late one night after my wife had just been diagnosed and he said, I've got a message from God for you. I said, okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, what is it? The only reason your wife is suffering is because there is secret sin in your life. And I said, well, I prayed about that and I don't think that's true. He said, well, I've got the message slightly wrong. It may be that there's secret sin in your wife's life. Which is when I hit him. Now I didn't. <laughs> but I was sorely tempted. How dare How dare you? Okay, next slide, please. What is being said that is exactly the theology of the three friends, the so called friends. So Eliphaz says, Consider now, who being innocent has ever perished? Where were the unrighteous ever destroyed? As I have observed, those who play evil, no sin, so trouble with it. In other words, bad people suffer for it. Job is suffering, he must be a bad boy. Next one, next slide. Bildad, as another friend says this, when your children sinned against him, he gave them over to the penalty of their sin. Your children died because they sinned against God. Okay, a bit stark, isn't it? You wouldn't want him sitting near the bedside when you just had a disaster, would you? And the last one, and actually, if you understand this one, it's even worse. Zophar says, Oh, how I wish that God would speak, that he would open his lips against you and disclose to you the secrets of wisdom. For true wisdom has two sides. Notice, God has even forgotten some of your sins. That's what he's saying there. You may be suffering, Job, but God's been quite gentle with you at the moment. If you, if you were suffered for all your sins, it would be worse. And you can think, how could it be worse? What more could Job have? What more suffering could Job go through? Maybe he could be a West Brom fan, but what more suffering could Job go through? What more? Who knows? But he said, oh, you know, God's being patient with you, isn't he? So, so the friends are quite clear. And the friends' theology is the theology of the so-called prosperity gospel. No Christian should ever be sick. If you suffer, it's either a lack of faith or the presence, it's the absence of faith or the presence of sin. Next slide, please. Imagine a suffering sin index. Imagine that you were to be able to measure suffering. Okay, you're out to measure a you know, whole range of things. And every person had a measure of suffering. You know, so say, out of a hundred. Okay, and somebody who's had a fairly nice and easy life so far, maybe they're in their 40s, they've had an easy life, happy marriage, happy family, they're on a, I don't know, a 10. And there's someone over here who's had a really rough life, maybe they're the same age, but they've had a really, really rough life, and, and their, 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 their husband was killed in a car accident, one of their kids was born with, with, with spina bifida and, and they're suffering with, with diabetes and so on. They've got a they've got an 80, 85. You put the index there, you put a line of people, and over here is the person with a 10, and over here is the person with an 85. Okay? Now here's the question: who is more spiritual? Who's the more godly person? The person there or the person there? And you ask that question like that, and a stupid question. Mm -hmm. The prosperity gospel says the person over there. Is either a bad person or they don't have much faith. The person over here is walking in prosperity, they've got great faith. Well, it's nonsense when you put it that way, don't you think? There is no connection between the two. Absolutely. Well, there is a connection. You know, the Bible says if you do wicked things, then there is a consequence, and often the consequence is in this life. And if you drink and drink and drink and drink and drink, then you, 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 your liver collapses. If you smoke 100 a day for, for 30 years, you might get lung cancer. So there is a connection between doing things that are stupid or sinful and, and the response. Of course there is, but it's not as simple as that. The book of Job tells us that. Look at the next slide, please. In the book of Job, three times God boasts of Job. But, you know, 
the friends say he must have sinned. Look at what God says. Then the Lord says to Satan, have you considered my son, Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blindless and upright. A man who fears God and shuns evil. If God says that about him, it's got to be true, isn't it? God says that three times about Job. And he says it about Job, even when Job has lost his possessions and his, his, his family. Chapter 2 and verse 3. Next slide, please. God condemns the theology of the friends. He says it's nonsense. And, uh, and, and it says, clearly, in other places, suffering is always the result of sin. So, remember the man who's, 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 um, uh, who's ill, and, and they bring him to Jesus. Uh, who sinned him or his, his parents? No, this is just to show the glory of God. Next slide, please. So, what are the other truths? And this one, because we've only got five minutes, and I've got one more point. And you want your coffee, don't you? Say yes. <laughs> so, so can we do this out loud? What are the half truths? Can you think of any other half truths or untruths? God doesn't love me. God doesn't love me. Okay. How can God love me if, I, if, if this is happening? How can God really love me? And it's tempting to think that, isn't it? Anything else? I suppose suffering is linked to choices we make, lifestyle or, or whatever, you know, I, I suppose you hear someone's got cancer and you, you've heard all the stories about the things you should eat, five things you should eat, five yeah. things you shouldn't do, and you suddenly think, well, what have they done that's yeah. caused that? It's almost automatic, isn't it? Our hearts are very legalistic, mm -hmm. and so we're always thinking somebody must have done something, there must be a fault somewhere. You know, um, what's the cause? What was, you know, and, and you can bring your brains trying to find the cause. And, and, and the thing about suffering is random. It's random. I think that we also puddle back when we, when we find that there is a, you know, that they. <laughs> and, and you just, because we've got these five things you do and five things yeah. you don't do, you, <laughs> you think, oh, well, I, well, I don't have yeah. that kind of food, or I don't smoke, or whatever. Yeah. With the, just reveals how much we're drawn into it. Yeah. Okay. That's how we are. I think also there are, there are people out there, ten a penny probably, who put themselves up as gurus as a solution. Yeah. And some of them are quite convincing. Five easy steps yeah. to this, that, and the and, 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 and the problem is, and, and I don't want to be want to be controversial, do I? No. Oh, no, <laughs> so much of what people see, I mean, on the God channel, so much of it is, is basic prosperity gospel stuff. You know, life is wonderful if you're a Christian. It's not marvelous being a Christian. And you never have any trials. And you know, I, I just, you know, some, these, some, some ladies, I mean, forgive me for putting it this way, some ladies said to me that I've decided I'm not going to have the menopause. <laughs> okay, I'm commanding the menopause not to invade my life. And I, I make a positive confession. Menopause go away. Menopause go away. Menopause go away. Well, I, I, I you know. Did you laugh? No, I didn't. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm kind. But I did laugh really. But not she when she was, and I just thought, okay, I mean, if, if she doesn't have the menopause, that'd be fantastic. But, but. I was going to say I've lived through the menopause. I have, but I've lived through being very close to it. So there we go. Let's move on. Let's move on. Let's move on. Next, next slide. Here's the second missing section. We've only got a few minutes, but it, I think it just helps us to, to get this. Here's the next second missing section. Next one, please. And it's this. There's an easy answer. There's an easy answer. You shouldn't have any questions if you're a Christian. You shouldn't have any questions. That's wrong. You should just trust God. You know, People are suffering. They don't necessarily need pat answers, but we give it. Just trust God. It's going to be okay. You, know, don't, don't know. you should be. When my wife lost her sister, her sister died in her, her early 30s. And somebody at church said, Oh, well, she's with the Lord now. You shouldn't be grieving. Why are you grieving? That's your sister. She's with the Lord now. You should be over this by now. God's ways are easy to comprehend. It's not that complicated. You're complicated. God's ways are easy. Next one, please. Uh, the glib answers are the best answers. It says that, but that's what they mean. A Christian should never have doubts. Expressing doubt is a sign of unbelief. I don't believe that. 
You're a lantern doubts when we don't understand. Doubt can become unbelief, but doubt and unbelief are not the same thing. Unbelief is like, I will not believe and I don't like God anymore. Whereas doubt is saying, Lord, I just don't get it. And we cry to the Lord. Next slide, please. In his life, Job expresses both doubt and fear. So here are some of the, oh, sorry, doubt and faith. Here are some of the things he says by faith. Uh, my witness is in heaven. Next slide, please. Uh, even now my witness in heaven, my hand will come on high, my intercessor is my friend, as my eyes pour out my tears to God. He talks about knowing that God is on his side. He's got someone praying for him. Remember, this is thousands of years before the coming of Jesus. This is wonderful. Okay, next slide, please. Um, uh, I know that my Redeemer lives. Next slide. Uh, I know that my Redeemer And in the end, you will stand there. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I am myself. In other words, he had a belief in the resurrection. Mm -hmm. Amazing. This is years and years before the resurrection of Jesus. Next slide. Um, at the same time, he has doubts. Why was I born? Why am I still alive? If you read through Job chapter 3, it's immensely painful. I wish I hadn't been born. This is so terrible. I can hardly bear this. Why did God allow me to be born? 300 questions, and most of them come from Job. Most of the questions Job saying, Lord, why, 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 why? Next slide, please. Uh, here's something Tom Wright wrote. Right. It is no part of the Christian vocation then to be able to explain what's happening and why. So, so this is something to say. You know, we can give some things, we can say some positive things, and, and we'll be doing that in the next two seminars. But it's not our job, our vocation, to tell people exactly why they're suffering. You're suffering because da -da -da -da. In fact, it is part of the Christian vocation not to be able to explain, but to lament instead. When people suffer, here's the thing to take from this session more than anything else. What they need is not someone to give them all the right answers, they need someone to love them, to put their arms around them, and yes, speak the truth, and help them to understand certain things. But they need somebody to help them. As the Spirit lamented within us, so we become, even in our self-isolation, small shrines, where the presence and our healing of uh, love of God can dwell, we can become the, the, the source of blessings. When we show them grace and love. Next slide, please. At the end of the book of Job, God speaks to Job. Remember the story? He speaks to him out the whirlwind. And he gives him a mild rebuke. But most of all, he gives him a full affirmation. He actually says to Job, now tell me, here's a few, here's a few questions, Job. Where were you when I made the world? And uh, do you understand how the world works? And have you done this? Now? And, and basically, he's not trying to belittle Job. He's just trying to say, Job, you can't understand some things. Job never gets an explanation, as far as we, we know. Next slide, please. In certain circumstances, we can see. So you remember the story of Joseph, and at the end of his life, he says to his brothers, you planned it for evil, God planned it for good. Now, I, I can see now, you know, being thrown into prison in Egypt, and sold as a slave, and all that. God had a plan, I can see it now. As far as we know, Job never saw it. The book of Job never tells us that God says to Job, now let me explain to you, I wanted to prove that your faith was right. I wanted to show that Satan was wrong. We may not see the immediate purpose, but we can see the big picture. The big picture is that God does have a purpose. We may not be able to read it. Ultimately, that purpose is to get us to heaven where there's no pain or suffering or sickness or death. Next slide, please. Anyone withholds kindness from a friend for sex, the fear of the Almighty, but my brothers, uh, are as undependable as intermittent streams as the streams that overflow. I've heard many such things, miserable comforters, I view. <laughs> so, so that's Job's judgment on the comforters. And our time's gone now, but just think about this. How do we comfort people in the midst of suffering? Do we go for the easy answer? Do we kind of say, well, you know, you're suffering because, 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 good. Are we like Job's comforters? Or are we real comforters? We show grace and love and so on. Next slide. What are the errors we should avoid? Just think about that. Maybe that's where we'll start next time. What are the errors we should avoid when we try and help people who are suffering? Okay? Good. Mm -hmm. Got a coffee. What time do we come back? Okay.